I do have my contact information up here. Uh, if you guys do have questions later on or you think of something, uh, I hope you, we have a lot of resources on farm transition planning. Um, even though we are in Iowa, we do a lot of uh, uh, legal research on how agricultural law affects people throughout the country. Um, also a lot of work with federal income taxation. So even if you're not in the state, um, I hope you will find our resources useful. And so um, I know everyone's on mute, but um, we, we also so were part of the university. I have a lot, we, I work with students sometimes and um, so I have to start off with a pop quiz and asking uh, true or false, only extremely wealthy individuals need an estate plan. So I'm, I'm using a lot of buzzwords today, like estate plan, succession plan, uh, farm transition plan, what that all means. And the answer is false. Um, everybody needs to have what in law jargon they call an estate plan. Uh, if you have money in your bank account, uh, if you have minor children, if you really own um, pretty much anything, a car, a home, anything like that, uh, you need to have a plan in place. Now, a estate plan might sound like this a little intimidating. It might sound uh, um, a, little, a little fancy, but everyone needs to have a plan in place for how to transition assets and um, other things, uh, management of a business upon death. So we're gonna talk about a lot of these things today. When it comes to succession planning, there's some key tasks uh, that everyone will need to do, especially if you are uh, if you have your own business. Uh, when one is choosing a successor, and now this might be done during life, right? Uh, who is going to take over the business um, so that you can retire? Um, do something different, whatever it is. Um, you And to do that, you have to plan for that shift in management. And now that might be one of the more difficult things to do, right, is choosing, uh, is to give up control. But we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you also have to be aware of, well, who's going to not only do the um, management has to go to the next generation, but also the ownership of the assets that you have. Uh, this is for both personal assets and business assets. Part of succession planning does involve uh, anticipating life events. There's a lot of normal life events that happen that are good things, right? Like marriage and births, and those can um, make you change your goals, right? Uh, but there's also other things that are hard to think about, but we need to be aware of is um, harder things like early death, um, early disability, divorce, anything like that. And as you're going through all of this, it's so important to communicate your plans and goals. So that is, um, we'll see a lot of these themes throughout it and that making sure your family, your loved ones know uh, what your plan is after you figure it out. So that, that doesn't seem too hard, right? I just gave you the four-step process to uh, have your succession plan. But unfortunately, there can be quite a few legal traps for uh, people who um, may not be aware of uh, all the rules that go on with this. And some of these traps, it can be very technical. Uh, we'll, what we'll do today is look at different cases. Um, a lot of them are in Iowa, but they apply to people uh, out of the state of Iowa as well. Uh, and we'll see some where there's technical errors and that uh, um, there's a lot of state specific laws, there's laws specific to um, uh, trust land, all different things like that. But we need to make sure we have the right team in place to um, avoid these technical legal traps. We're all experts in something, um, but we want to make sure the right team, whether it's a lawyer, a tax person, whatever that is. Some of these traps that we see people fall into are unfortunately just common sense. Uh, but just because they're common sense doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, address them because they can be very easy to overlook. So look at some of those issues that can come up as well and what we can do to avoid them. Okay. So part of what I do is I do um, monitor cases, Iowa cases, national cases that come out of the legal system when there's a farm family dispute. And um, uh, I used to be more of a math science person before I went to law school. And so I kind of did my own study uh, and I really have noticed three main areas that there's estate disputes. And so we'll talk about them, but the first one's just failing to plan. Um, some people don't want to plan at all or don't plan at all. Some people don't plan with the right help, uh, but there's issues that can come up with that. Um, 
Another uh, common area that I see where estate disputes occur is disappointed beneficiaries. Uh, people are convinced they thought mom and dad was going to do one thing, or their aunt and uncle, whoever it is, and then after they pass away, they learn out that was not the plan at all, that they were not on the same page, and so the issues didn't come up with that. And then the last kind of area that I've seen is just people not anticipating life events, like these normal life events that we talked about already, marriage, birth, death, divorce, these things, good or bad, they do happen, they're very common. And uh, uh, there has to be, those that have to be acknowledged and have a plan in place for them. So I'll go through and just look at a few different cases and what we can do to avoid this because um, one of the big goals I think for all of us is to make sure our, uh, our family does not fight, you know, our kids get along, our siblings get along, whoever it is. Um, we wanna avoid becoming a, uh, ending up in the court system. So let's talk about failing to plan and that that can occur in a few different ways that we see this. The first is just people, like I said, don't um, they they don't plan at all for whatever reason. They um, uh, they don't have a will, a trust, uh, any type of legal document, any type of um, tool, legal tool to help them um, get to the next their assets, the management to the next generation. Um, some people, they may have a plan, but they don't plan with the right help. And we'll see how that can be some of those technical errors that come up. And then finally, not, I call not planning collaboratively, not thinking, uh, you know, you might have the right help. We have a very generic plan, which can work for some people. But if you have specific goals, um, only you know your, you know, your family situation, your operation, your business, uh, what it needs. So we have to do all those things in mind and plan for what is best for you personally. Now, why do people avoid estate planning? And I mean, you know, the a lot of us can imagine why, but this is a couple of reasons why I hear um, why people say they um, they don't want to talk about estate planning, they don't want anything to do with it. And some people say, we don't need to make an official plan. Uh, we've told our family what we want to do and we expect them to honor our wishes. And that um, that is great that people have that type of relationship with their family, that um, they trust them, but uh, there's a lot of state or uh, there's a lot of laws that come into, well, if you don't have a plan in place, we're, the state's going to, um, or the federal government's going to dictate what happens to your assets. And that that's very specific based on where your location is. Um, other people say, we don't need to make an official plan. We just want our kids to get everything equally. You know, we like the state splits up everything equally so that um, that will work just fine. But that doesn't always take into account, well, we'll the difference between fair and equal, is that what your kids want? Um, do they want to own the business together or do some of them, as much as they love the idea of that, they have other goals and dreams they're working on? Um, some people will say, well, I made a plan once, right? I don't need to do this again. But again, those life events are gonna keep occurring. Your goals may change, um, your situation may change. So you have to have that updated. And then finally, some people just, um, it's very uncomfortable. What we're talking about today is very uncomfortable, right? We're talking a lot about uh, death. We're talking about finances. This isn't something that's easy to think about, let alone um, talk about. But we'll see that uh, estate planning, a farm succession planning, it really is a selfless act that you do for the people that um, you leave behind, uh, because then you, they don't have it. It's you know, we're talking a lot about the legal side of things today, but practically it's a very emotional time to lose a loved one. So we want to make it as uh, smooth as possible for them. So, right, because estate planning really is for everyone. Even if I, uh, some of you listening, you may have thought, well, there's some good reasons why I don't want to talk about that. Um, but this is something for everyone. Not everyone's estate plan will look the same though. Uh, and that's why you have to determine your goal. So as we're talking today, uh, I want you to think about, well, what is my goal um, to, do I want to bring a new generation on? Um, do I want to expand the business? What is it? And some people, a common goal that I hear is that, well, I want to make sure the management and the ownership of the farm, it goes to the next generation, uh, whether that's a beginning farmer nearby, um, a family member, whoever it is. Uh, that's a very common one. One is wealth management, how to most economically get the business to the next generation. Uh, some This can be done during life is that, well, I would like to have the family on the farm. I would like to have my kids help me, my brother, whoever it is. I want to work with them. This is a family business here. Or 
you know, I want to keep growing. How can we have multiple generations, multiple families supported by the farm? Uh, other times I hear, uh, well, I, you know, so in Iowa, people say, well, uh, this farm has been in, um, uh, I grew up here. It's very sentimental to me. There may be other sentimental items you guys are thinking about. And I know the laws are different for, uh, again, trust land, but how do we keep this in the family um, or make sure it goes to whoever your loved one is? And maybe there's some things I didn't hit, right? There's things that you're thinking about. Well, this is my goal. This is what I want to do. Uh, so just, but as we're talking, I hope you keep it in the back of your mind um, because unfortunately there is no one size fits all option. Uh, it could, it just depends on the person. And that's why um, we don't have, we have a lot of resources on our Beginning Farmer Center and Center for Agricultural Law website. Um, but we didn't, you know, that's why it's very hard to find a will or something, a generic form of it, because it is so specific to the individual. But uh, sometimes there's a joke that failing to plan, failing to plan your succession plan, it, it that is a plan because there is going to be rules in place that say, well, nothing was um, decided. So here's what's going to happen. And at least for the state of Iowa, what goes on is they have these things called intestacy laws. Um, and again, this could be, this varies, but for our state specifically, um, they look and say, well, who, who's, was this person's family and, um, someone who's married, but no kids, everything goes to your spouse. Um, you know, and they're, they're trying to get it right. Uh, if you have, um, if you're unmarried, but have kids, everything goes to your kids. So they really start out close as they can to family degrees. And then they slowly start going out, out, um, out further and further to see if they can find anyone. But this is uh, something that can be very messy to clean up because it might not be the best situation. People may end up owning assets together that don't necessarily want to. Um, and that's why you got to take your family situation into account. So I want to get into our first. Um, uh, oh, Don, is there a question? Yep, there is one question. Um, let's see here. This person is asking where they could find a trust lawyer in Louisiana. Do you happen to have any resources for a question like that? I So I do not have any specific Louisiana um, uh, references. And ironically, it's uh, uh, Louisiana is the one state that has different laws than every other state. They have a special system, but there are attorneys there. And a lot of states do have something like a... Um, uh, like in Iowa, we have an Iowa find a lawyer. It's a website. And there, I think there's almost every state has this, like a Louisiana find a lawyer, or you can talk to the bar association. Um, and they may have a list of uh, attorneys that give low to uh, low to free, low cost to free consultations um, that you can uh, start to find. And I, I would not to get off topic, but if you're looking it's nice to look for an attorney, not necessarily like a trust attorney, unless you have a trust and that's why you have questions about it. But um, usually for the Iowa find a lawyer, there's, uh, you can search by practice area that might be agricultural law or um, estate planning, and you can cast a wider net because um, it, you don't want to, you want to go in with your goals. Uh, this is what I want to happen. Not necessarily, I want to trust and I want an LLC because um, some lady from Iowa said they were great. And so um, that, that's something I would look at as the Bar Association, that website, and it casting a wide net. So that's a very good question. Thanks, Kit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so talking about that, finding an attorney though, I wanna talk to a case that happened in Iowa where um, uh, a, fam a farm family tried to go at the state planning alone um, and they ran into some technical issues that were very specific to the state of Iowa, but it, you know, it, this can happen anywhere that the uh, proper procedures were not followed and some uh, issues came up. Uh, but what was going on here in this case, um, there was a couple, they owned a farm together, they had a farm operation, and they, uh, uh, according to the case, they really wanted to avoid probate. And probate is where um, you have a will the court process, there's a legal court, uh, process to go through the court system to transfer assets. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is slow, it's slower, right? And um, it can cost money. So they said, we don't wanna do that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make, we're gonna sign a deed, giving the farm to our kids, all everything. Um, 
But what we're going to do, we're giving them the deed now, but we're also retaining all rights of ownership while we're alive as a, as a married couple. So they do this, um, this, uh, this couple, they have three kids. They name their three kids as the, um, uh, also as part of, uh, on the deed, but this, the wife, the grandmother, um, she, after she, uh, her loses her husband, he passes away. She starts to think, she says, well, I have three kids and I, um, one, my one daughter though, she's on government aid. She had some type of health condition that, uh, had her qualified for government assistance. And she was worried that there's going to be some type of clawback. The government was going to try to take the assets. So even though this daughter, she has three kids, she said, that the grandma says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to change it. I'm still going to name two of my kids on the, um, deed. I'm the owner upon death. It goes to my kids. Um, but um, and she said, I love my daughter. It's just, I, I want to protect, I want to protect the farm. So that's what she ends up doing. Well, eventually, so, because this is getting kind of, uh, the family tree is getting kind of confusing. I have uh, what's going on here. Um, the grandmother who made the deed, the original deed, she passes away. Her daughter with the uh, health condition also passes away, but that daughter leaves behind three adult grandchildren. So we have those three adult grandchildren who are alive and then their aunt and uncle, um, their mom's brother and sister. So yeah, the daughter um, with the health condition, the grandma, they pass away and um, nothing really happens. There's no formal estate filed or anything like that. And the three grandkids, they just kind of assume that, well, something went on and mom was disinherited. So we don't have any um, interest in the farm. But for, and then for some reason they get it, the utility company realizes that they do own it. It's not quite clear. And they get this payment and they say, oh, do I have some ownership? Um, and this goes to trial. Then there's a case about it. And the court says, well, what this, what the grandma was trying to do was called a transfer on death deed. And those are valid in 30 states um, that you can have, uh, I own it during life upon death. This is going to automatically transfer to whoever I name. But in Iowa specifically, uh, these are not allowed. So again, this is a state specific issue that um, the family just did not know about. So what had to happen is that um, they had to pass the, uh, the farm had to go through intestacy where um, the state go, looks at degrees of kinship. Um, and you can see here what would happen. Each child would get a third of the farm. But since the daughter with the health condition had already passed away, her third went to her grandkids or to her kids, to the grandkids. And the grandkids who have sued the uh, aunt and uncle now end up co-owning the farm together. They own less, but they own a third together. And um, this just goes to show that this can be, uh, uh, these technical issues can cause a lot of fighting. Not only are lawsuits very expensive, but this had to, I mean, I don't know this family, but looking at the case, um, you have to think this caused some conflict that they're no longer having um, holidays together or anything like that. And so, yes, again, even though 30 states have adopted laws that allow these transfer on death deed, Iowa is not one of them. Um, if they would have been in our neighboring state like Nebraska, it would have been valid. But this was that small technical error that came up um, because they did not have the, uh, the right help. And so that's why uh, it is important to note here that, and I don't expect anyone to be making their own estate plan after this, but investing in good help, these professionals, um, that's gonna, even though it can be hard to see what they charge now, that can be much less expensive um, than trying to fix a mistake after it happens. And so that's why you do need to have that team of advisors. Uh, this is not the place to um, try to uh, necessarily save money and go with, um, uh, you know, do it yourself type of thing. I, you probably have all heard of legal zoom where there's supposed to be these documents, but uh, especially with a business um, when there's family involved, that is just not the place to cut corners. And when you are looking for an attorney, so whether that's in Louisiana, uh, South Dakota, Iowa, wherever it is, uh, I encourage people to look for um, uh, people who have experience in uh, working in a rural community or working with uh, farm families, because there's an extra dynamic to it. Um, not only is there a lot of rules and regulation around it, but just the family uh, aspect and some of the tensions they may understand a little bit more. And that should be in all different areas to make sure you know what they're um, 
they're talking about. And, and at least in Iowa, it seems like people uh, in rural areas, they sometimes they either they either do um, estate planning or they, they can do it or they really specialize in something like criminal law. You know, I wouldn't want someone who's doing criminal law or specializing in divorces to necessarily make my will if that's, you know, so talking, well, what is your, pri- what do you primarily do? Where, where is the, your primary practice area? Um, those are questions to ask. So, and another way that there can be an issue with failing to plan is not planning collaboratively, um, not recognizing that farm succession planning is a, uh, it's a family matter, right? If you're working with your family, if you have kids um, who want, you know, a lot of times what we see conflict come up or um, where there can be is if one child wants to stay and help on the farm and the other one, even though they have great memories, they want to go, they're living in, um, in the city now somewhere. Uh, that's where this needs to be a discussion, um, especially when there's differing goals in the family itself. Um, and this is where we, you know, we want people spending the holidays together. Uh, you want to make sure that um, if there's one on-farm heir, one child who's interested in it, are they being involved in the discussions? Um, do you know what people want? And, you know, because I'm one of five kids. As much as I love all my siblings, there's one or two I can think. I like spending time with them, but I do not want to own a business with them or really be um, too involved in something like that. So uh, you just want to make sure that everybody, these conversations that you're using the fam- a family meeting to talk about these things and involving everyone that needs to be involved. So just remember that when it comes to these uh, lawsuits, that there is not as much control if something goes into the courts. If you can negotiate, if you can um, work with your family, now, um, that's mu- going to be much less expensive. Um, it's not going to be public record. Uh, you're not, and you don't know what's going to happen when something goes to the, before a judge or a jury. Um, oftentimes we see that you know, either mo- both parties wanted one thing, two separate things, and the judge will choose a third option. And so neither party really wins. They just spend a lot of money to be forced to compromise and not do it on their own. So that's when, you know, if there is a, um, tension um, as you're trying to do some farm transition planning, talk about it, think, is, is there a compromise? Um, what can we do to make this work? And uh, what can we do to make sure that litigation or fighting is preventable? Um, that maybe will involve getting that, tra- that will involve getting that transition team together. Um, things, and depending on the size of the operation, it depends on what you need, but at least an attorney, an accountant to help, if you have who's ever helping you with your taxes can be a great start. Um, having the proper insurance, all those things. You also uh, want to be very intentional in your plan. Uh, if you have kids, well, who, you know, we don't want to just say everybody's getting a third between your three kids, because that could cause issues as well. Because um, well, they, like I said, maybe we'll have very different goals. And I do, sometimes when I do talks about this, I hear a lot of Parents say, well, they really want to be equal, though. That seems not fair to not to give one child more. The on-farm heir gets more help or something like that. But um, you have to remember that sometimes uh, fair fair and equal really are not the same things because equal means the same, right? Um, Everyone gets the same portion of the business, of the farm operation. But, you know, when being fair can mean what does um, each child need in order to be successful? Uh, and you're, if you have kids, if you are a sibling, you know that everybody maybe has different goals. Um, I've heard one of my colleagues will give the example of if one kid, uh, if they break their arm, you don't say, well, I can't take them to get their arm fixed because my other kid didn't break their arm. You know, that's a silly example, but it doesn't have to be exactly equal like that. It's what does each kid need to be successful? Um, and that, you know, sometimes people will ask me, um, well, how do I decide what is fair then? And that's really a question only you can answer. Um, some people have ideas where they're, they want to say, well, it maybe will not be the same equal number wise. Maybe one kid is getting, you know, if you broke it all down to the basic math, one child does get more, but maybe the other one got more help during life, um, you know, helped um, with a down payment for a house or going to college, something like that can be a, um, an option as well. So it's something that you need to think about. 
But I'm going to move on to talking about disappointed beneficiaries now and some issues that can come up with that. And um, you, you all know what a will is, but uh, um, it's just that document that lets you say how you want your property distributed after you pass away. And in Iowa, to have a valid will, it seems pretty simple. Um, it has to be in writing, so it can't be a video or anything like that. Again, uh, the person making the will, that testator has to sign it, and there has to be two witnesses. So that, that does seem very, very basic, right? But where we see issues is really this last element. It's this testamentary capacity. Because um, what testamentary capacity means is that there is a, uh, um, a, a mental ability to understand what's going on. And it's, it's a pretty low bar to meet. Um, but if there's not testamentary capacity, what there's often claims of is that, oh, as mom and dad got older, um, my sibling, they unduly influenced my parents to change their will, to change their mind and do something different. And they, um, they got a better deal out of it now. So that's where we see a lot of these things that when people are so surprised about what their family ended up doing, that that's where these claims of undue influence, lack of testamentary capacity, that's where they really come up. Um, and I think some of the next case I want to look at is really going to highlight how important it is to communicate in transition planning. This is one of those common sense that, yes, kid, I know I should talk, but it, it's easier said than done, right? When you actually get your uh, your own family involved. So look at this. Um, here, this is another Iowa case. And what was going on here is that there was a, um, a farmer who uh, farmed with his son. And they had worked together for many, many years. This, uh, um, they all, he, the farmer also had three other kids who did not farm with him. Um, during life, this farmer gave his son who worked with him all these great deals for um, rental rates for the land. He gifted uh, assets to the son as well. Um, and then when he passed away, he ended up giving a majority of the farm to that one child. Uh, it sounds like the three siblings were very surprised about this. So they say, well, you know, my dad, as he got older, he did not have testamentary capacity. In fact, they even claim that the, the law has changed in Iowa since then. They say he's a vulnerable elder. My brother took advantage of him um, and was able to trick him. And so this goes to trial, then it goes up to um, actually the Iowa Supreme Court. And the court says that, well, no, your age alone is not enough to show that you're a vulnerable elder. There has to be some evidence that um, he was able to be tricked, that he couldn't protect himself. And here in this specific case, they saw, well, this man, he was, uh, I think he was in his late 80s, close to 90. Um, but age alone, like I said, is not an indicator of um, the lack of uh, testamentary capacity. His medical records show that he had normal memory and comprehension. Just practically, he had been recently reissued his driver's license. Um, he took care of himself and his finances. When his wife uh, passed away, he got her assets through the probate process. Um, there is just no evidence here that there was any type of uh, um, undue influence or that he could be taken advantage of. But uh, I think this is a case that goes up. It's often difficult to talk about what your goals are. And it seems like after looking into this, that the farmer, he just wanted the farm to stay in the family. There was only one child who had stayed back to farm. This was just his goal. And it's very expensive to get into farming, right? It's very hard to um, get the proper assets, uh, get the capital that you need. So to make sure that his son was successful, he gifted everything to this son, um, which, even if you and I don't always wouldn't agree with it, that is a valid uh, goal to do, uh, to have. Um, but we have to make sure that we are communicating those goals to our family because we don't want to leave this with our family. You know, we don't want to leave um, this mess behind that now they have to talk about it or that um, by openly communicating, this was my plan. Uh, there is really no way that the beneficiaries can say, oh, he was tricked. No, he's talked about it for years. He's talked about this goal. Um, and that, that's, a, that's one of those common issues that come up. It's a common sense issue, but very important to think too that, um, you know, determine your goals and make sure your family knows them or whoever needs to know them knows them. Okay, I have one more case about disappointed beneficiaries that I'll look at real quick and, uh, here, what was going on, there's another farm family. There is a um, uh, a, mo a mother or her, um, her husband passes away and she updates her will. 
Um, she says, I'm going to have everything go to my son and daughter equally. Very normal. Two kids, everything gets split down the middle. Uh, quite, you know, quite a bit later, almost 15 years later, she does suffer from a stroke and her daughter ha ha uh, begins to completely care for her. Um, the son, he's farming the farm. That's his job. He, uh, he starts to do quite well, um, becomes uh, uh, financially well off. He gets married. He has kids who are working with him. The daughter um, does not do that. She stays home to take care of her mother. She does not get married. She lives at home. She sacrifices quite a bit of her life and her career to take care of her mom. So after 13 years of that, the mom, the, her, her goals have changed. She says, um, I'm going to make a new will. Instead of splitting everything between my son and daughter equally, I really want everything to go to my daughter. She says, I have no ill will against my son. I love him, but you've done, he's done very well and doesn't need the help um, like my daughter does. So I'm going to leave everything to her. And she passes away the next year. Well, not surprisingly, um, the son is upset. He would like to have half the farm. Um, and uh, and so he tried, he he brings this lawsuit saying, no, this was um uh this was undue influence. My sister tricked my mom into uh uh changing the will. The daughter does her own lawsuit, it's kind of a mess. And then what happens here is that this goes to a jury trial. And the jury says no, there is not enough evidence of undue influence. And the jury, we don't exactly see how they came to this conclusion, but I made up my own scoring system um, to kind of show some points that I think were very helpful that, that this mom did right. And first, I'm going to give her two points because the, uh, the mom, the testator, she updated her will um, two times. The first time when, her life, when there was that life circumstance that changed, her husband passed away. So instead of everything going to him, she says, I want everything to go to my kids. Um, and then when her goals changed, she updated again. So she was continually updating um, as, as needed. She also explained her reasoning. I think this was goes to the communication piece, um, why she was doing it. It wasn't um, uh, out of the blue. She explained why she was doing it. Uh, sometimes attorneys will, uh, if they are, it could be a will contest like this, some fighting, they'll say, I'm going to have to, I'm going to record you. I'm going to ask some questions just because I want there to be no debate at all that you had the testamentary capacity. Um, then I, I gave a neutral point for this because I don't, we don't quite know what went on, but when it came to communication, there was evidence that um, the mother, she was telling her grandsons about how she wanted to leave the farm to the daughter. So um, on one hand, um, we don't know if she actually told her son this, but she was at least telling the family. So um, I think that was, uh, she She did what she want, uh, needed to when her goals changed. And when um, uh, uh, she uh, uh, made sure that was communicated to her family. So this was um, a good example of what to do right. So what can we learn from that is that um, to be successful, it really does depend on the dynamics of the people that are involved in the um, succession plan, right? Um, businesses in general, they how to be successful, it, it depends on the business partners themselves, right? Generally, um, and sometimes when there's family dynamics involved, it can be a lot messier. But what we've seen here at the center is that the biggest reason that multi-generation businesses fail just really is because of uh, family fight, fighting within the family, which is really too bad. So remember, don't wait to make or update plans as hard as it can be, you know, to think about and annoying to do. If something, you know, if something changes, there's a new child in the family, um, you get married, anything like that, make sure the plans do get updated. And then remember to communicate, um, even though it can be very uncomfortable. And I know it can be hard. I even heard people say to me who are there, they're the, uh, the older, the retiring generation. And they'll say, well, I want to talk about, talk about it, but my kids refuse to talk about it with me. They say, mom, you'll never die. I don't want to talk about this. And so it can be hard either way um, to talk about these types of things, but you need to make sure your family is having these conversations and knows your wishes. And then some, uh, many states do have, uh, agricultural mediators in Iowa, we have the Iowa Mediation Service that specializes in, they give a specialty division of uh, farm mediation, where you can hire someone that, especially as the matriarch or patriarch, 
of the family, you can uh, say, if you want to be involved in this, you need to come to this mediation session. Um, Cause that's easier said than when that's easier to do it than if um, it's a bunch of siblings and one sibling really wants to resolve things and the others don't. So consider that that's uh, less expensive than an attorney in court instead of a mediator who try to find a middle ground for everybody. Okay, and then I do wanna talk about this last section then of uh, um, anticipating life events, these things that can happen and just pop up. And so um, I've said this a few times now, but there is several life events that just happen. Um, some of these are good things, but a lot of these are gonna happen in our life in some way, whether it's to us, a family member, a friend, a loved one, um, but there's people have kids, they get married, um, people unfortunately get divorced or get injured. Uh, agriculture is a very dangerous um, job, right? It's hard, it's dangerous to work in it. And so these things happen. People um, pass away and there's fighting, right? Disagreements. Another thing that's going to happen, though, is that you have to have, and I'm sorry if you guys can hear the construction going on. I thought they said they'd be done at noon or my time noon, um, but hopefully it's not going to be too bad. Uh, but something that needs to happen is eventually with a farm business, who's going to manage it after you? Are you going to bring on the next generation? Because uh, practically, that's not the best thing to do is wait until a person passes away and then someone else just has to pick up um, and start from square one. Um, you, you want to do the training beforehand. And again, this is easier said than done, right? To turn over control. This is something that people have worked on for decades to grow a successful business. But you want to make sure you're finding that successor, whoever it is a child, neighbor, beginning farmer, and starting to understand where do they excel? What do they need to learn at? Um, what is their uh, uh, gifts that they're, they're good at doing? Um, do they have, should they, um, how can you grow their learn or their, um, their skill set? Do they need to go to school or training programs or anything like that? Uh, so you can slowly start to transition over the business, whether that's, you start with um, understanding financials, uh, maybe they start with, or uh, they usually start with some um, labor, some sweat equity, learning the books, uh, finally getting some ownership, things like that. And then they can master every part of the business and be as successful um, as they as they can be. And you've set them up for success. Uh, so just remember, Rome was not built in a day that this things will take time, but you don't want to take too much time either, because if someone... Uh, can't support their family through the business and you know they're going to get frustrated and they maybe will start to look for other opportunities. When it comes to transferring control um, to be successful, it prior you should really need to prioritize that transfer of management. So people that you guys uh, families should be talking or whoever it is um, saying, well, what are our goals? Um, we want to make sure we're on the same page. Because um, one example that I have here that I've heard of is that um, well, what if the um, the child you're, that's farming with their parent, they say, well, we wanna have the biggest farm in the county or you know, wherever it is, they, we wanna grow, we wanna be um, well-known throughout the, throughout the area. But if a parent's main goal is saying, well, I wanna start to pay down some of this debt, um, those are almost contradictory. It's very hard to you know, obtain more land, more assets, whatever it is, while at the same time paying down debt. Um, we also want to make sure we have a structure in place that allows for the younger uh, generation to have some management authority so that uh, both parties can contribute. It's not just, uh, you know, so it's more of that joint venture instead of a uh, employee employer relationship. And then lastly, when it comes to that management, uh, turning over the management, uh, starting to think, well, what will retirement look like for me? How will, um, Will I always be involved in a very small way? Um, do I want to stay involved quite a bit or do I um, want to be a snowbird or something like that? I only come back when I help when I want to help. So, you know, I retirement can for a farmer can look very different than it does for um, other folks, but uh, just start to, you know, what is the final goal and is both all, are all involved okay with that? So I have one example here of a um, of a case that happened in Iowa where some people forgot to anticipate a life event of marriage. Um, what happened in this case is that there was a uh, a farmer um, in his twenties. He made a will um, that left he was unmarried. He left everything to his siblings, which made sense. 
because uh, he, he wasn't married. He said he's closest to his siblings. Everything's going to go to them. Um, in his 40s, he gets married um, and never updates his will. He uh, eventually passes away when he's 90 years old. He owns all the um, farmland in his name still. And so because his will says everything goes to his siblings, that's that's what was supposed to happen, right? But in Iowa, so this, again, this is an Iowa-specific rule. Um, in Iowa, if there's a, a spouse who is not included in a will, they get to, um, they have this elective share is what they're called. It's the one they can choose to elect against the, their spouse's estate and get a third of the value. Um, the idea behind this is that we don't want a spouse who's accidentally disinherited, you know, I'm assuming like in this case, um, to not have the ability to take care of themselves. The only way around this is if there's a valid prenuptial agreement, but that was not the case here. So um, what this surviving spouse has to do is that she has to try to um, go through this process of taking her spousal share to get the one third of the estate in order to make sure she's taken care of basically. Um, and now she was able to do that, but you, you know, reading this, it's hindsight's 2020. We wonder is that it seems like what the husband would have wanted is for his wife to get everything. And also she has just lost her life partner of um, many decades. And now she has to go and uh, go through this process. And we don't want our family having to deal with something like this um, when it really is a time of, uh, you know, grief at that time where so, um, someone needs to take care of their emotional needs. So we want to avoid situations like that, even though there's laws in place that try to protect um, the really bad stuff from happening. Um, we want to avoid it as much as possible and make sure our family doesn't go through that. That's why um, beneficiary designations are so important. Um, now, if you're updating your estate plan in general, that might not be as often you have to do it. Um, every few years or if a laws change, your family situation changes. But this is what I would encourage everyone to do is just yearly try to think if there is any beneficiary designations that need to be changed. Because um, there's really beneficiary designations on everything. You have life insurance, retirement accounts, um, bank accounts that are payable on death, a trust, a will, anything like this. Uh, there's going to be a beneficiary designation. And what frequently becomes an issue is that people just don't name a beneficiary at all. Uh, maybe they don't, they don't even start to plan again. Or they had a job, um, you know, when they were in their early 20s, they had a 401k and they just completely forgot about it. And it just, um, it goes to nobody. They never updated it. So this is why it's important to take inventory of your assets and make sure those um, beneficiary designations are up to date if there was a change. And this is something that I think could be done in a very short amount of time. Just well, in the last year, you know, it's, it's uh, the holiday season or, you um, uh, it's tax season. What am, what are we, um, was there any changes? Most of the time it's going to be no, but, um, just, just think about it and make sure things are spelled correctly. Okay. Now I want to just end up talking about some things that are part of that part of an estate plan that um, sometimes you don't always think about, but that are a part of a, uh, just a healthy all encompassing estate plan. Um, and so I'll go through some of these that uh, um, are can be important for everybody. Um, things that you need, or at least need to consider. Now um, that that can be very very useful in when you're planning your estate. Okay. First off is just life insurance. Um, I really encourage people to look into this because uh, this can be a very useful tool um, to help. Uh, a farm family, and also can make sure your family's taken care of when you pass away. The general rule of thumb is that you should be uh, have about six to 30 times your um, annual income, whatever that is, that's a big range, but obviously it depends on a lot of different things, um, depending on the amount of debt you have, how much wealth you have outside of that, um, if your family needs it. And if you are part of a, a, a relationship, if you are in a relationship where one person has a consistent salary, the other person does not, um, or does not have a earn a wage at all, um, I would encourage you to consider uh, ensuring that non-wage earning partner as well. Because if they, um, if this person is staying uh, in the home, taking care of um, kids, the house, everything like that, you can find these calculators that show how much it's actually worth 
um, and something you don't want to think about that you know, if you have to take over and start paying for it or you know dealing with it, um, it can again make a very hard time a little less stressful. There's term and whole life insurance. I won't really get into it because I'm not an insurance agent, but um, you, talking about all this with your family can be, uh, or with your, your family and then your insurance agent, well as someone who specializes in this, um, can be very, very useful. Uh, this can also be part of the state planning strategy um, to make sure that you're, if you have someone farming with you, they have the assets to continue to do it, or that's fa the fair versus equal debate. Um, if you're leaving the farm to, one child, can the insurance be used to um, as a gift for the other child who's not farming? There's ideas like that. The insurance can be used as an estate planning uh, tool as well. Uh, financial power of attorney, this is something everyone should look into as well, because what this is, is the document that gives someone else the power to manage your financial affairs. And so there's power of attorney in general. We'll look at financial and then health power of attorney as well. Um, and this is a document that really can be very, um, you can make it what you need it to be. It can be very limited where someone has uh, just powers to do this one specific thing or one or two things, or it can be broad that they can do anything that needs to be done. Um, you can also have this be springing or durable where a springing power of attorney, it only comes into play if uh, um, there is, for some reason you're not able to take care of your finances. Um, the durable one's a little bit different where it's in effect now and it's going to stay in effect. And these are only good, these uh, power of attorneys, until um, the person who created it passes away. Then a will or the trust, whatever that document is, would take over. So again, yes, you, that document that uh, that is created, that will just uh, define what the powers actually are. Um, people use it for sometimes with their tax professional saying, yes, you can um, have power to sign for me on my tax returns. Um, maybe they'll uh, give you uh, power to someone else to make gifts on their behalf, transfer property to a trust, uh, anything like that. Um, and other times you can have all of these things, just one, it's whatever you need. Uh, but this does, there can be good things for this too. If you're in a business and you need some, if you're the only person that can sign on behalf of the business, maybe, or for your family, um, if you're the only person that is taking care of bills, something like that, you want to make sure that someone else can take care of this too. Because if you're just traveling um, and someone else can take care of these things for you, or um, unfortunately, uh, there can be illnesses, right? Um, people can develop um dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, all things like that. And it, this can avoid the need for a conservatorship then because where when a conservatorship happens is a, um, uh, that has to go through the court process usually to say, and the court's gonna try to determine who could take care of this person best. And a lot of times there's fighting about that too among siblings of uh, who, who should take care of mom and dad, who can do it the best. And so you wanna have that named in advance. It can be very beneficial. Healthcare power of attorney, so very similar to financial power of attorney, but it um, gives someone else the power to make decisions about your healthcare on your behalf if you are not able to um, tell someone what your decisions are. This is something though, that if you decide to do it and you uh, consider using one, um, make sure that uh, you have talked about what your wishes are with somebody. Cause this is something that I have, even if I was working on my own, um, talking to my husband, um, it's hard to be thinking, well, what are my wishes? Um, what would I like? Because if I am struggling to figure out what I would like um, to happen, and, and if I was in a, a, a certain medical state, um, you know, it's a problem for me or a struggle for me, how much harder for it is my husband or, you know, your loved ones to try to decide that for you. So um, make sure you are talking about this. There is also um, living wills that you can create. So very similar to a, a regular will that, um, could you can use that if death is inevitable, um, you cannot communicate your wishes. You can specify what medical treatments you would like. And so here's an example of what it, you know, will say is something like, um, if I have this incurable condition, um, the doctors are sure that it is not reversible, then I direct my attending physician to do these steps. It's hard to think about, but it can take some um, stress off of your family again. Uh, it maybe we'll talk about life-sustaining procedures that um, you want uh, comfort, 
um, some medical uh, um, help, but that eventually this is what you would like. This is the medical procedures you do or do not want. So I uh, consider that as well. Another medical item um, is just HIPAA authorization. Um, if you are over 18, I would encourage people to look into this too, because technically, um, once you turn 18, um, no, nobody except you can access your medical records, right? So if you do want your parents involved, if you want your spouse to be involved and know medical, um, uh, know about your medical history or anything going on, make sure you have this signed um, so that they can talk to your medical care provider. Part of this too, um, this is so moving on to, um, uh, this is something hard to think about, but if you, if anyone has minor children, it is incredibly important to have determined a, uh, a guardian for those minor children, because if the unthinkable happens and both parents pass away, uh, you do not want um, this child who's lost both their parents to be thinking, uh, um, going through a, the court process of the courts trying to figure out who should be the uh, guardian for this child. Um, the courts, again, they're going to try to get it right, but you know your family best, right? If you have certain um, religious views you would like honored, maybe, you know, you know someone who would do that or uh, educational goals, anything like that, uh, you know, even the courts, again, they'll try to get it right, but you know your, your situation best and who would be able to take care of a, a minor child. Okay. This is one of the last things then. Um, long-term care. This is another thing I would encourage people to look into because this can get very expensive the older that you get. Um, but I found the statistic that there, we all have a one in three chance of spending at least three months in a nursing home or something or a facility like that. And as we know, medical costs have just gotten so expensive. So unless you are um, very, very wealthy or you qualify for Medicaid, for everybody else in the middle, um, long-term care is a great option to make sure that you are um, taking care, that your medical needs are taken care of. And then you don't have to worry about depleting all your assets that you've accumulated. Um, and that can be preserved for the next generation. You, you know, on one hand, you have worked hard, you should use your assets as you need to and take care of yourself. But on the other hand, this is something that can just be so expensive and easily drain a bank account. Okay. That was a lot of different stuff to end with, but uh, you know, now what you've heard a lot and uh, um, I encourage you to start off, well, figure out what are your uh, assets um, to order to create an inventory, um, set your goals, uh, get those advisors together, your attorney, your insurance agent, whoever it is. Once you have your plan in place, place you wanna communicate with your family and then actually implement the plan, right? Make sure everything is, um, is going uh, as you wanted. If you um, thought this stuff was interesting, we do have more resources. Um, like I said, I'm part of the uh, Center for Agricultural Law and we run the Beginning Farmer Center with Iowa State. Uh, we have a farm transition and estate planning section um, that you can find. It's at beginningfarmer.iastate.edu. And we're also hosting a two-day conference in February um, about farm transitions and farm transition planning, especially if you're a beginning farmer, it could be interesting. I know you guys are kind of a drive, but uh, um, there is an online option. We'd love to have you guys in Iowa, but um, there is an online option as well. Is, that, is there any other um, questions? Oh, I can. Hey kids, so I think you answered all of them and then I there was one in there, but it was similar to the previous question. So I just added some notes in there, but. Um, I did unmute everyone. So if you would like to um, speak out and ask a question, you're welcome to raise your hand and unmute and ask. But I had a few questions and I wrote them down, Kit, but you answered every oh. one of them as we went through. So I'm all set over here, but I want to say thank you for um, presenting today. It's great information. And I know that in indigenous community, this subject is, is culturally sensitive. And um, what mm -hmm. I have seen people say is, you know, you got, you got to plan for your things. You got to make a plan for your things. And mm -hmm. if it is culturally sensitive, we need to think about the next generation. And I see Shirley is raising her hand. So I'll go ahead and unmute you, Shirley.
Well, I'm I'm letting you unmute, but it's not it's not allowing. If you want to put allowing me to talk now. Yeah, there you are. Hey, Shirley, go ahead. Okay. I'm the one from Louisiana. Oh, okay. and this is one of the problems that we have down here. We've went through all the processes of trying to find a lawyer here. There isn't any. No lawyer understands farmland. And we would like to give it. My son wants us, if we get our loan that we're planning on getting, and I'm going to be 70. My husband's 68. He just went through his fourth open heart surgery. I've had three back surgeries. So mm -hmm. we're going to, we want to be able to give this to my son and his, his kids. So it keeps going on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. What happens when you can't find a lawyer that will do Louisiana that understands what we want? We're having too many problems trying to get somebody just to write up a look. So right now, it's, our will says to me, if I die, it goes to my husband. If my husband dies, it goes to me. Mm -hmm. But we need it to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. We want it to go to my son. My daughter wants wants nothing to do with the farm we told her she could have everything inside the house mm -hmm. and she, that was great her. our son would like to take the farm my grandsons want the farm so we would like to get it both to both of them but we can't find a lawyer and Louisiana understands that they said oh you just need a simple will no it's not a simple will so where do I go from here yeah the, and so uh, I, I completely understand how frustrating that could be because I think throughout the country there is just um, rural populations are struggling, right? I, there's not as many resources out there anymore. There, I mean, in Iowa, we have a couple counties that have one attorney for the whole county um, and they're doing, so they are doing divorces, estate planning, all the criminal charges. Um, but I'm glad to hear you have goals in place. You've been thinking about this. Um, why don't you send i don't know if you saw my email earlier surely if you want to shoot me an email i can try to see if there are find some of those things i looked i talked about earlier um okay. and we can go from there just and i will say you know it's kind of um uh a little ironic that you know as a uh with the indigenous uh, laws are very different than iowa than state laws but louisiana is the one state that has different laws than the other 49 states um so it, I'm sure it is a little bit harder to find, you know, you, you're trapped in your state for people uh, specialize in that um, special Napoleonic code that Louisiana has, but why don't we stay in touch and we, I can see, we don't give attorney recommendations, but I can see what resources are out there in Louisiana, because that is um, very frustrating. Right. And my husband's American Indian. Okay. Um, and we can't get any help from the Indian lands because... He's Cherokee and Choctaw, but his parents, his relatives never signed in to any tribe because they were too scared of the government. They jumped ship on the tears, the, the Trail of Tears. So we don't have uh, 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 the Cherokees or the Choctaws that we can go to to get help from them either. So mm -hmm. we just, it's really frustrating when you can't find somebody that understands us and what yeah. we want to do preserve mm -hmm. our farm mm -hmm. to keep it going especially if we're going to put money into this farm that's going to be the largest greenhouse growers in the state of louisiana growing vegetables and we're de designating our food to go to the food banks and also to the schools wow. this is what my son would like to keep going too if we can get everything in place mm -hmm. right now we're having trouble with the government because we're end up in another lawsuit before we're over with like the keep seagull, we were in that. Oh. We're gonna yeah. have another one pretty soon. Oh gosh, yeah, why don't you send me an email, Shirley, and we can um, see what there is. Yeah, I just, um, I was, I'm very, you heard very Iowa focused, but why don't, why don't we stay in touch and we can see what we can, um, what type of resources are out there for Louisiana folks? Okay, I appreciate that, because mm -hmm. there's not just me, there's other farmers too, Yeah, they're in the same boat. Okay. And yeah. they've been looking for lawyers. Mm -hmm. No, we'll we'll stay in touch and see what there is. So, um, yeah, just shoot me an email and we'll we'll figure that out. Okay, so, great, I'll do that today. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So I think. All right. Thanks for the question, Shirley. Um, so just to be mindful of everybody's time, we're six after twelve. Um. 
if there is no other questions, um, Kit, do you have anything to close this out here? No, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. I hope you found this um, useful. Um, and I apologize for going over, but yeah, I hope it's, you know, it's, a, it's a big topic that we get a lot about. So um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us or, you know, use our resources online. So, but thank you so much for having me. Right. Yes. Thank you again, Kit. We appreciate this. Um, I'm going to pop in the chat our feedback survey because we want to hear from you all what type of webinars you want to see um, from here on out. And we're getting ready to compile our 2023 webinar listing. Um, so please feel free to take a moment to offer your feedback in that survey. Um, and if you have any other questions, we have put our emails in the chat and you're more than welcome to reach out to us. But thanks for joining us today. And thanks again, Kit, for facilitating and presenting on this issue for us. Thanks so much, everyone.